Universitas Literarum Serdicensis, nomine Sancti Clementis Acridensis, ex sententia Facultatis Scientiarum Physicarum, virum eminentissimum ad reverendissimum, professorem, doctorem Gerhard Paulus, doctorem honoris causa Scientiarum Physicarum, Universitatis Serdicensis, nominavit ad declaravit. In ius querei fidem, hoc diploma, sigillo maiore Universitatis Roboratum, et consvetis subscriptionibus munitum ei dandum curavit. Datum service ante diem undecimum calendas junias, anno domini bis milesimo octavo decimo. Dear Rector, dear Dean Preissou, dear colleagues from the University of Sofia, dear ladies and gentlemen, this is an overwhelming procedure for me. I'm very grateful for, for this honor here. I know that an honorary degree is one of the highest academic distinctions that one can receive. And in particular, if it is from a university as prestigious as this one, yeah, it's uh, really exciting for me. Um, I know this university, actually, from the beginning of my scientific career, my diploma work um, was co-supervised. Well, actually, the actual supervisor was Professor Dojan, uh, Stojan Dinev. Um, and I have very good memories of him. Then later, I worked for a short period with Ivan Christoph, Professor Ivan Christoph, who is uh, here. And of course, then uh, since quite some time, with uh, Professor Alexander Dreischu. Professor Dreischu also introduced me to uh, Bulgarian history, so he removed some of my ignorance. He still has a little bit of work to do, uh, I'm afraid. But uh, actually, yesterday we uh, visited a few remarkable places here. And uh, this here is on the fortress of uh, uh, Asim, 
and uh, we also visited Plovdiv. Uh, so it was, uh, and of course, before we saw Sofia, so we are very impressed, so my wife and me, uh, whom you see here under, under your flag. Of course, I won't talk about the work I do together with uh, Professor Dreischu. He can explain this much better to you and much, of, much more often uh, to you. Um, I also don't want to talk about one of my newest hobbies, which, which is actually precision polarimetry. Um, I learned that I get the privilege here of presenting one lecture per year. I don't want to exercise this privilege every year, of course. But uh, I also learned that I miss your national holiday in two days from now. And perhaps next year or the year after next year, I'll come around this time in order to give uh, a presentation, of course, not on the 20th, uh, 24th, because nobody would have time there, but perhaps the day before or after. So what I rather would like to do is to talk about the birth of attosecond laser physics as um, um, as already announced. We'll start with uh, saying a few words how short these pulses are. So we go from the femtoseconds, I'll explain what this is, to the attoseconds. So femtoseconds is easily the state of art, attoseconds are not yet. And then we have to see how to access um, this short time scale, this really short time scale, with, with laser technology and the difficulties I also try to explain, and uh, then um, a few words about uh, matter, in particular femtosecond laser pulses, and then uh, an application that um, I hope uh, you find uh, exciting. It has nothing directly to do with other second physics, but uh, certainly indirectly to do with it, as we'll see. So, um, a femtosecond is um, a really short time period, um, 14 zeros after the comma, and then one. So this is 10 to the minus 15 femtoseconds, and this, such a short time is actually unthinkably short. Um, even if I try to, uh, to explain it uh, with comparisons. Um, so uh, the 10 to the minus 15th part, or the 10 to the, uh, uh, of the age of the universe, this is just seven minutes. But this actually doesn't really help because nobody can imagine what a certain billion years are. Um, I can also try another comparison. So in one second, the light travels from the Earth to the Moon, a little bit more than one second. But in a femtosecond, it actually doesn't travel a hundredth of the thickness of a hair. So uh, it, would be, uh, it would need 300 femtoseconds to cross a typical thickness of a human hair. Well, um, however, a femtosecond is still long. If we compare it to the time scale of, um, of an electron that moves around a nucleus, then this time is on the order of 150 attoseconds, so which is 10 times shorter than, uh, than a femtosecond. So an attosecond is actually 1,000 times shorter uh, than, a, than a femtosecond. And, you know, in order to watch this, um, we, uh, we would need pulses that are shorter than uh, this period. So a tenth of a, of a revolution time, so a tenth of these 150 attoseconds, namely 15 attoseconds. This would be a good time resolution in, also, in order to take a sharp picture of the electron as it moves in atoms or molecules um, or other mat matter. So you see, if we have a laser pulse with a duration that is unthinkably short, namely five femtoseconds is still far too long. Um, and even if we subdivide this, uh, this laser pulse and we think about the duration of an optical cycle, then it's still two and a half femtoseconds, um, depending on the color of which you use, so, which is still too large. However, we can't make these pulses shorter. Any laser pulse must consist of at least one optical cycle. And in the visible region, therefore, we can't make pulses shorter than that. And in order to use um, laser physics to access the attosecond time scale, we need to invent mechanisms 
um, that have subcycle resolution. And those revisiting electrons that I mentioned in the title of this talk, these are ex uh, actually the key to get subcycle resolution. And we'll see how this works. But first, um, let's look at a molecule. Some, uh, something more complicated uh, system here. And you see the electron still moves in this approximately 150 attoseconds around this molecule. But the vibration, the motion of the nuclei of the atoms of a molecule, this is much slower. This is actually on the femtosecond time scale. So typically 10 to 100 or actually even a few hundred um, of femtoseconds depending on the mass of the, of the atoms. The lighter um, atoms move, of course, faster. The heavier one, less fast. So you see that the motion of the, um, of the atoms in a molecule, this is actually the thing that we can watch with femtoseconds directly. And actually, this has been done. Um, so the, um, the Nobel Prize, there was actually a Nobel Prize to Ahmed Seveil. Uh, in uh, 1999, um, he was watching with these ultra short pulses the rearrangement of atoms in a molecule directly. This is femtochemistry. He gave an, uh, got a Nobel Prize, and I'm sure also for other second laser physics there will be one day a Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, not to me. Uh, so the candidates um, I put up here uh, would be Anne Paul Pock, Korkum, and Ferenc Krauss. I'm pretty sure that the latter two get it. I'm not so sure whether Henri Lee gets it. Well, this is the injustice in, in physics, I'm afraid. So, but uh, she certainly, did, in my opinion, deserves it most. Well, uh, anyway, why do we then need other second laser pulses? I mentioned that already, uh, that we want to watch the electron moving around the atom. But this is actually a fairly boring problem. The really interesting problem is, well, it happened here already. Let me try to do it again. Um, for a molecular, for a chemical reaction, the first step is that there is an electronic rearrangement, which I depicted here uh, in a very rough picture. Yeah, so most physicists probably would hate it. Um, but what you see here is actually um, that the molecule, uh, so the electron moving around the molecule suddenly decides to take another electronic configuration. And then, only then, after this electronic transition, which is fast, which is on the other second time scale, um, the um, chemical reaction takes place. So you see, femtochemistry, in a fundamental sense, is incomplete in order to get really at the beginning of, the, um, of what's happening in a chemical re uh, uh, reaction, we need to look at the Otto time scale. So we need subcycle resolution. How do we do that? Um, we do this if, uh, when we use intense femtosecond laser pulses. So here you see um, an atom with a lot of molecules in this case. And the arrow should indicate a strong laser pulse. What does a strong laser pulse with an atom. Um, in my favorite physics books, book, I found, found a picture and illustration. This is this one. So you see uh, an intense beam hitting, hitting a, a solid ensemble of, uh, of something, of matter. Yeah? And you see what happens. There's a lot of noise. Particles flow up, uh, fly apart. And uh, in the background, you see even the physicists. Yeah? So those with the question marks there. The physicists wondering what's going, what's going on. Um, now, if you look at this in a little bit more modern way, so you know this is Asterix. I think this is also very well known here, is it? Asterix? It is. Yes. Yeah. So, as I said, my favorite physics books, I will come back to it. Um, so, if we look at this in a little bit more abstract uh, way, um, I said a lot of noise. So, what we create is actually not noise, but it's it's more music. These are the harmonics, the overtones. So what we can create um, in the interaction of a very strong laser field with, uh, with atoms um, are harmonics of the laser field, very high harmonics actually, um, such that we can create laser-like, so we say coherent radiation 
um, from um, from these uh, from this matter, which is a very um, valuable um, uh, radiation. So the other thing that can happen is, of course, that the electrons fly apart, and we would register the photoelectrons, and then we can also register the ions, singly charged ions, doubly charged ions, actually very high charge states. And the interesting thing is that no matter at which of these effects you look, each of them has a very characteristic appearance and um, gives valuable information of what, what's going on. And each of them um, was the starting point of some um, intense uh, discussion. Um, I'll uh, only cover two of them and actually uh, mostly only the photoelectrons on which I worked. So if we look again at this atom, at this electron moving around the atom, uh, and we ask now ourselves, um, what kind of field does this electron feel? Uh, feel? Yeah, so the proton is positively charged, and uh, the electron is just half an angstrom, which is 10 to the minus 10 meters away from this, from this nucleus. So it feels a very strong field, a very strong electric field, actually 5 billion volts, 5 gigavolts per centimeter. We can easily, this is a remarkable thing, we can easily produce such field strengths also with a laser. We can produce much more than uh, a gigavolt per, per centimeter. So we can apply strong fields, so strong um, as compared even to the scale um, of, of atoms. And um, if we look at this a little bit, uh, in a little bit more abstract way, then we would plot the potential of the this proton here shown in red is a Coulomb potential, and um, um, yeah, so it's strongest, of course, closest to the atom. And uh, then we would uh, see what this, um, what uh, if we superimpose the electric field of the laser. So you see it's slowly evolving uh, this laser field. So this is this red curve, and it distorts the atomic potential. So it starts to shake it back and forth. And uh, since this field is really strong, it can, so the distortion can be even stronger than the distortion um, of the potential uh, by, the, uh, by the nucleus itself. So this is, um, this is actually what, um, what happens here. And um, the next thing is that we could look at what happens to an electron. So if uh, at, a certain, at a certain instant of this laser pulse, a photoelectron comes out. What happens to this electron? And um, what happens, I can show actually at a small demonstration. So here is the electron. And um, what happens is that it actually rolls up and down this potential in just this way. So I showed you on an animation what's really going on. Now, if the electron comes out at the peak of the electric field, as indicated here by this blue dot on the, on the red curve, then the electron is accelerated back uh, away from the, uh, from the atom and back to the atom and um, away and back. So it goes, uh, goes as long as the pulse uh, is long. Yeah, so if it is longer than here, it goes several times back and forth without gaining any, uh, any energy. Yeah, so these photoelectrons will have zero kinetic energy on average. So perhaps I should explain uh, that on the vertical scale, there's the kinetic energy of this electron um, or the potential electron for this, uh, for this surface. Well, um, if we now look um, at a photoelectron that came out a little bit earlier than the peak of the cycle. So I make a zoom in here. So I zoom in so we just see the central cycle. And now the electron doesn't start right at the peak of the field, but a little bit earlier. Then the trajectory of the electron will be completely different. And what it 
Yeah, so we have a subcycle detail now for the for the first time. So we are now already in the utter second. We are already doing utter second physics uh, with this simple uh, interaction. And you see, uh, when it starts a little bit earlier, then the electron actually drifts away. In other words, we can measure this time when the electron came out by measuring the energy that the electron got. And it's actually very simple mass with which we can do that. Now, the opposite case, where the electron comes out a little bit later, and, well, the trajectory is actually very similar, it just goes in the other direction. Yeah, so the electron, so we already, we also know whether it came out before the peak or after the field, depending on the direction that the electron finally takes. Well, but there is a more peculiar thing here. So if you look at this trajectory, then you see that the electron actually comes back to the vicinity of the atom. So let's plot this thing here in a little bit, let's zoom in, yeah, and let's look at this trajectory in more detail. So you see the electron is accelerated back, and it comes back, uh, it's accelerated away, and it comes back, and when it comes back, at the moment where it comes back, comes back, it has a significant, significant uh, kinetic energy. And now several things can happen. Um, the most prominent example is if the electron recombines, which is shown here. So the electron goes back to the ground state and a high energy photon is released. So this is what I call the noise or later the music that's created on the interaction of strong laser fields uh, with with at atoms, but also molecules. The other thing that can happen, um, well, actually, uh, this is harmonic generation. I show a harmonic spectrum. So um, if we look at uh, the noise, at the music that comes out, we see distinct lines. And uh, this was discovered by Anne Lullier. And uh, actually, we awarded, so my university awarded her an honorary doctorate for that, uh, for that really important uh, discovery. So here you see Anne Lullier in the, in the back, our president. And at that time, I was the dean of my, uh, of my department. So it was, uh, it was a, uh, a very nice procedure uh, to have Anne Lullier in, in Jena. Well, um, let's come to another phenomenon. Um, the electron not only may recombine, but it may rescatter. In order to see that, I zoom now out. Yeah, so we see this, uh, this detail um, where the electron is driven away from the atom and then back. You can hardly see it, uh, so I play it once again. So now the electron is driven away, it is driven back, comes back with a lot of energy, rescatters, so changes its direction and therefore absorbs more energy from the laser field, and then the electron flies away with even more energy. And, um, well, this instant where the electron rescatters is, of course, very short. Again, on the other second time scale. And uh, by analyzing the rescatter electrons, um, as well as um, um, harmonics, of course, um, we, can, uh, we can get timing information um, of the processes that went on. And, uh, well, actually, I discovered this phenomenon, so uh, the consequences of this phenom phenomenon, which is this high energy annex on this red curve, um, I discovered this uh, during my PhD thesis, so I was uh, very lucky uh, at that time. So, now, the next thing, in order to get even more control on the other second time scale, is to use few cycle laser pulses. Actually, uh, for the sake of simplicity, I've shown you throughout already a few cycle laser pulses. Yeah, a pulse consisting in full vis uh, half maximum just of two optical cycles. Um, you can easily imagine that there are other manifestations of the evolution of the electric field. And I show this here. So you see, depending on what we do to this uh, field, the waveform of this pulse can be very different.
And this can be a controlled parameter um, in order to get even more access to the subcycle regime. So if we would write this laser pulse in this, this formula, so we have the envelope shown here in gray, so E naught of T times the cosine of T, of omega T, then we see that we need another quantity, this phi, in order to, um, in order to represent this pulse. And this phi got very famous, um, well, um, 10 years ago or so, that's uh, even more than 10 years ago. Um, so the derivative of this, um, of this uh, quantity of this phi, which I call the absolute phase, some people call it carrier envelope phase, the derivative, the temporal derivative of that was actually also a Nobel Prize uh, for that hench in 2005. But here we use it in order to, to do, um, to do other second resolution. Um, and, um, well, depending on this absolute phase, um, the photoelectron spectra look different. So what you see here um, is that I just rotated this pulse by, by 90 degrees so that it goes from, from, uh, from, uh, uh, from the bottom to the top. And what you see is that one of these pulses, so the pulse shown here on the, uh, on the left, that it has a stronger field strength to the left than to the right. Whereas on the panel on the right, um, these pulses have, we would say, inversion symmetry, so their field strength is equal on both sides, or uh, also the, um, the dynamics, um, so the weak pulse comes before the, uh, the weak peak comes before the strong peak for, the, for one case, and for the other case, it's the other way around. So in a, in a simplified picture, and actually I have to confess in an oversimplified picture, you would perhaps imagine that this uh, pulse um, on, the, on the left would produce, would pull out more electrons to the, to the left than to the right, whereas this other pulse pulls out uh, electrons in equal uh, amounts. Well, the picture is oversimplified, so in detail it looks a little bit different, uh, but the idea is, um, the general idea is right. Of course, we could also, we could also use this concept of an absolute phase also for longer pulses, as you see here. Yeah? So also in this case, uh, on the left panel, you would have to look very carefully to see that the peak on the left side is larger than those on the, on the, on the right side, whereas the other one still has inversion symmetry. But of course, for a long pulse, uh, you hardly can see any difference, and therefore, um, you see the value of, um, of short pulses. I like to illustrate this also with a cartoon. Um, again, Asterix, yeah, so uh, the helmet game. So what you see on the left is a long pulse. It doesn't matter from which side the first blow comes. And on the other side, you see, uh, on the uh, right panels, you see uh, short pulses. And there it matters whether uh, Asterix hits the soldier from the left or from the right. Depending on that, the helmet flies in one direction or the other direction. Yeah? And uh, in real life, it's, it's similar. And what do we do? We put two detectors in order to detect not the helmet, of course, but the photoelectron. And um, in order to make things um, simple to, to remember, we color these detectors. So the left one is colored in red and the right one in black, according to the political series, uh, uh, to the to political colors, right? Uh, so we always remember easily um, which electron, um, yeah, we plot all electrons in red uh, that were detected by the left uh, detector and those uh, that were detected by the right detector are colored uh, in black. And we built such an instrument. Yeah, so this is a vacuum apparatus, a simple vacuum apparatus. And you see a detector on the, on the left and one on the right. And if a laser pulse comes in, there's some gas in this interaction region, then electrons fly in both directions. We not only count them, but we also measure their energy. So we measure their time of flight. So we measure in uh, the current on both detectors time resolved. And um, then uh, if we plot that, then we find that actually these spectra, these photoelectron spectra, 
they start to run. And uh, from their detailed appearance, so if, uh, um, if one looks at these, uh, the theory a little bit in more detail, then we can actually use this in order to resolve the subcycles, that, that means the utter second um, dynamics of photoionization, but one can also generalize uh, this to other sy systems like molecules and most recently even solid state material. Actually, one can also put things around, uh, which, we, which we did in particular, um, and use these phenomena in order to measure this absolute phase. Because this absolute phase is one of the most important quantities and pretty difficult to, uh, to measure otherwise. Um, so one can use these photoelectron spectra, so the plateau that I, so this uh, high energy annex that I discovered during my PhD thesis with long pauses at that time, uh, one can now use in order to measure the carrier envelope phase with quite high precision. So let me come um, to the last part. And here I will talk um, about imaging, about cross-sectional imaging using the high harmonics. So what I call the noise or the music that uh, is created in the interaction of strong laser pulses um, with, uh, with atoms. So, this is XUV radiation. We call this XUV radiation. What you see here is um, the full spectrum um, of electromagnetic radiation from radio frequencies to gamma rays. And the visible range you see is a very small range here actually blown up. And uh, in the UV and the deep UV, um, this so between say five nanometers or three nanometers and 50 nanometers, this is what we call the extreme ultraviolet. And with high harmonic generation, one can create these, um, um, these, uh, this radiation. And also, this radiation is very short. Um, actually, one can um, prepare an experiment in such a way that these are attosecond um, pulses. And, but what I now want to do is to use this for imaging, for spatial imaging. And of course, eventually we want to combine both so that we have spatial imaging and time resolution. We would call this then 4D imaging with nanoscale resolution. So now, why want, do, do we want to use XUV radiation? Um, XUV radiation has a very short wavelength. And there's a famous physicist, probably the most famous physicist in Jena, and this was Ernst Abbe, and he discovered that in order to resolve structures, the wavelengths must be as short uh, as the structure you want to resolve, basically. Yeah? So if you have shorter wavelengths, then you can resolve finer structures. If we have uh, XUV radiation with a wavelength, say, of 10 nanometers, then if the numerical aperture is, uh, is also high, then we can resolve perhaps 10 nanometer resolution. And in Jena, this is of course put in stone. So here you see uh, Ernst Abbe in, when he was a distinguished uh, man. So he was actually a, not only a great scientist, he was also a great uh, entrepreneur. So he was uh, the director of, uh, of the Zeiss company after Zeiss uh, died. And he was also a social reformer, so quite a, quite a remarkable figure. And there his formula in Jena is put in stone. Um, so uh, D is the, is the structure that you want to resolve, lambda the wavelengths, and uh, in the denominator you see the numerical uh, aperture uh, that also needs to be high. I want to talk about something else, something a very different way to do imaging. And this was discovered only 25 years or 28 years ago, 1990, and it's called coherence tomography. Um, coherence tomography is an interferometric way to image, and it can image in, in depth, so it can, image, uh, it can image the depth structure of something. Yeah, therefore, it's called tomography. You know this from computer tomography, but this one here works completely different. Uh, it uses the principle of coherence. And I'll explain this um, 
in the following. So we use uh, the famous Michelson, Michelson interferometer. So we have a beam splitter and we have two mirrors. Actually, I replaced one of these mirrors already by a sample, which has a certain depth structure. So uh, the beam splitter splits the beam, so one goes up and is reflected, comes down to the detector, and the other part goes straight through to the sample, is reflected there, and also goes to the detector. In contrast to um, a Michelson interferometer, to most Michelson interferometers, we use here broadband radiation. Usually you would use a narrow band laser, for example, for a gravitational wave detector. You would use a very narrow band, just a single frequency. But here, we do just the opposite. We use white light. And uh, white light, the technical term uh, would be white light has a short coherence length. So white light can't interfere very well. Um, in order to, to interfere white light, both arms that you see here, so the distance from this um, upper mirror and the distance from the sample from the beam splitter need to have exactly the same lengths. Yeah? Otherwise, you won't see interference at the detector. And now, one can use this. So if we, um, if we um, build some electronics that detect something only if there is interference at the detector, then we can actually move this reference mirror and whenever um, we hit a depth in the sample such that the length, so, such that the distance of the reference mirror from the <coughs> speed splitter is exactly this layer, uh, the distance of uh, these different layers from the beam splitter, then we get interference. So this you see in this uh, inset. Yeah, so once again, um, this is the important point here. Um, perhaps I should... And uh, then, of course, the same thing for this, for this layer. If this distance and this distance are the same, then I see again interference. And, well, if I move this, um, this so-called reference mirror then, and uh, look for the interference, then I can see... Well, uh, thank you. Here on this image, yeah, so uh, I would see the depth structure of the, um, of the sample. So far, this has been done only with visible and actually infrared light, and it became a very important medical device at uh, ophthalmologists. And what I did um, in Jena is that I went to an ophthal ophthalmologist's office, and uh, he asked what I want, and I said, well, I need an OCT. And he said, what? Why do you need this? I said, I need it for my lectures. And here you see my retina. So this is an OCT of my retina. It's a pretty healthy one, uh, the ophthalmologist told me. So, and uh, such things uh, don't cost very much, actually. Yeah? So this is a standard procedure in advanced ophthalmologist's offices now. Um, so one can... And the resolution here is, well, is a few micron, micrometers, a few micrometers. Now, um, if we try the same thing, if we look at the coherence lengths, then you get this formula, and what you see is, if you use shorter wavelengths, then actually the resolution goes, the resolution increases with the square of the wavelengths. So if we make it, the wavelengths 100 times shorter, we get 10,000 times higher resolution. And there's also this delta lambda in the denominator. Yes, the high harmonics are very broadband radiation, so this also helps. Yeah? Um, so this is shown here. 
So we had the idea to do OCT with high harmonic generation. We thought that this is a really brilliant idea, but the second thought was, well, maybe it's a really, a really stupid idea, because this wavelength region is also known as the vacuum UV. It's called vacuum UV because XUV radiation only propagates in vacuum because it's quickly absorbed in matter. Even in air, just a few tens of micrometers and everything is gone. Yeah? Only in the X-ray region it becomes transparent again. But the third thought was there are a few remarkable exceptions. For example, there is silicon. And silicon is fairly transparent in the wavelengths region between, well, uh, for photon energies between uh, 30 and 100 EVs. And if you calculate the possible resolution from these numbers, then you get a resolution of 11 nanometers. And of course, semiconductors uh, are mostly made of silicon, so therefore this is quite important um, uh, for, um, for semiconductor industry. The other prominent example uh, is uh, the water window, the so-called water window. This is the region, the spectral region, where oxygen is transparent for radiation, but carbon is not transparent. So if you now look at a cell, then you get a high contrast from the carbon inside the cell. And this is uh, why the water window is so exciting for, for the life sciences. And uh, again, we can just calculate uh, the uh, possible resolution. It turns out to be three nanometers even in this case. Um, and we tested this principle at a synchrotron and uh, we found uh, that these predictions are actually fully, um, fully valid. Later, we used high harmonic generation, um, so la lab-based radiation in order to, uh, to look at these uh, at, a, at a sample. So we asked colleagues in, in Jena to prepare a sample that consists of two, of two gold layers. One was buried 330 nanometers below the surface and the other 220 nanometers below the surface. And we even wrote some letters on it. So you see XCT is on the, on the upper um, um, layer. And we tried this principle and indeed we found that, uh, that it works perfectly. Yeah? So actually we found, we found more structure than ordered. We just ordered the two gold layers but uh, they made a mistake during deposition, so they took it out, so they had a, a very thin oxide layer, which is this blue layer here. And uh, we discovered it, they didn't believe that uh, we can measure that, because even uh, a transmission electron microscope um, has, has problems. So this false color uh, imaging, they're uh, marked with these blue arrows, you see um, this thin oxygen layer that we easily saw. In order to see it with a transmission electron microscope, we had to slice out, um, we had to use a, a focused ion beam in order to slice out um, um, a slice, a 100 nanometer thin slice from the sample, so we had to destroy it, uh, and put it then under the transmission electron microscope, whereas OCT is a non-invasive method. Otherwise, I would not have used it on my retina, right? So, um, with this, I want to conclude. So, what we have learned is that electronic transitions proceed on the other second time scale, because the electron is so light. Chemical reactions, in particular, are initiated by electronic reconfigurations. If you want to use a laser, a visible laser, then we have to remind ourselves that the optical cycle is far too long, 100 times too long. So we have to have sub resolution uh, in order to get to this um, electronic time scale. And uh, a mechanism in order to do this is to use strong laser fields. Yeah, so think about this cartoon, this Asterix cartoon. Um, this, is, uh, this was the starting point of utter second laser physics. But also the music from from these effects, the high harmonics can be used um, for nanoscale imaging and uh, coherence tomography thus allows 3D 
and if we later use uh, also timer resolution, then even 4D non-invasive cross-sectional imaging. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you for this great honor to speak here again.